Greetings and welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight. I'm very happy to be here for something that's really quite unusual, something new. Uh, my guest is Luigi Venditelli, who actually is a friend of mine and Tracy's for a number of years. Luigi is the president and CEO of uh, Motivo. This is operating out of Montreal in Canada. Motivo has started, uh, has a division within it called We Are Not Alone. You can figure out what that means. We Are Not Alone. WANA is what we call it. And uh, one of the, uh, the the first major project that this company has done is to work very closely with Bob Lazar. That is the Bob Lazar to do a comprehensive recreation of of everything, everything having to do with S4, everything to do with Bob Lazar's experience. This is crazy stuff. You really want to see what we've done. So their division is called Project Gravitor. Luigi is the executive producer of Project Gravitor. Uh, they just, uh, this is amazing stuff. So I just want to jump in. Luigi, welcome to the program. Thank you, Richard. It's yeah. always a pleasure. It is indeed always talking with you as well. So I want I don't want to keep people waiting uh, too long on this. I want to jump right in. I would like for you to tell us what we what we have in store here. You have sent me a number of incredible images uh, that are recreations of essentially the Bob Lazar experience. As for they're extraordinary, people are going to want to see these. Uh, can you just give us a little bit of a backstory about how this all came about? Sure. Well. First, again, thanks for, for letting me be on here. It's always a pleasure. I'm a big fan of yours, so this is great that we're able to talk about the project. So first thing is this all started like almost two years ago. And uh, as We Are Not Alone had gotten uh, started within the company, we wanted to start working on projects that were very near our hearts in terms of the best quality stories that have ever been uh, laid out in the public regarding this topic, whether that be UFOs, flying saucers, or even potential extraterrestrial contact. So uh, we've, we've done a little bit of work already with uh, some of the uh, witnesses that were at aerial school back in 94, and that's something that will eventually come out in the future. But we wanted to start it off with a project with Bob Lazar. Mm -hmm. It all started off with an idea that we simply wanted to create one of the most realistic reproductions of the craft that he worked on. And the reason why we did that is because we said, every time you see something out there that has to do with UFOs or aliens, in terms of anything in product like, it's always kind of cheesy where it's always, there's always a little bit of a lighthearted cheesiness to it versus how serious this topic is. Mm -hmm. the like yeah. people like you do, things that have been going on in the congressional hearings, very incredible things are coming out. So this topic is much more uh, digestible today in society than it was 20, 30 years ago. And because it's actually coming, there's a lot of evidence that is coming out. So th sure. it's, a, it's a serious topic. So we wanted to basically create something that would have been a serious product and we thought if have, if we have to recreate a craft which craft do we choose and who do who would we know that has actually been inside one so and that's, that's bob lazar <clears throat> that, was, I mean, that was your that guy was bizarre yeah so our, we i reached out to uh, his office about two years ago spoke to zach which is his right hand at united nuclear uh, I pitched the idea saying, look, we, we want to make a model. I've been making stuff for 25 years. I kind of know what I'm doing with that. I would love to have an opportunity to say that Bob helped us on this so that we could promote it as something that is officially what Bob says and not all the stuff that's online that is horrifically inaccurate, by the mm -hmm. way. There's a lot of inaccuracies. <laughs> out there. So uh, I guess my conversation with Zach must have allowed him to realize that I was serious. He spoke to Bob. Next day, Zach calls me, says, look, he says he's willing to at least talk to you. So we had a call. First conversation with Bob was mainly him trying to figure out who I was. So he essentially said, if you wanted to do this, how would you do this? I'll never forget. That was the first thing Bob said to me. He goes, 
how would you go about in making this? So I started explaining, you know, all the years I, I spent many, many years of my life in China. I, I, I learned how to make things for a long time, then brought that knowledge back to North America. So I started explaining how I know how to use metals and casting and how to integrate different materials like silicone and all that. So he kind of stopped me. He says, okay, I, I, I could see that you know what you're talking about. He goes, so we basically hit it off and he said, all right, come and see me. It all, it all began with a trip to meet him in his home in Oregon where we sat there for a few days going through the absolute details of that craft that he had seen, witnessed, and worked in back in 88 and 89. Mm -hmm. And I left Oregon, came back to Montreal. My team was excited that I came back with this like mountain of data that we said, now we got to take this mm -hmm. and create something with this. So using today's technology, there's a lot of ways of doing it, but before we even thought about making a, a physical model, we had to create a digital file. Sure, yeah. So the digital file started off in a very basic way uh, so that we could at least get things on a screen so that we could write a million notes on every different section. So we had uh, created, believe it or not, like at the very beginning, I think we had like 90 pages just on the craft. And that included every single part. This, the, 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 basically, everything Bob could remember, we had very good measurements. And everything Bob said, look, I, I can't tell you 100% because I wasn't that close. I didn't go measure that part. So we went with mathematical approxi approximates based on the ones that were accurately measurable. Sure. So we came up with something very, very precise. And as we were building it, I started realizing that there was this evolution happening in the 3D world, not 3D printing, by the way, 3D uh, design. There was a lot of new technologies emerging by when we started this, uh, there's an engine created by Epic Games called Unreal Engine. And it's this phenomenal 3D engine that you could create any environment in if you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So we started off with Unreal Engine 4 because that's what we had at the time. And I hired a few people. One of them had also worked on Marvel comic movies. So I had some pretty good people who knew how to use Unreal. Uh, I had hired contractors from Sweden, Lithuania, Japan, uh, England, and, um, and Finland. I had a whole bunch of experts from around the world all working on creating the craft in unreal and as we did that now this this was like also new for me because i had never worked with some with such a, a technology before and as things were progressing things were becoming wildly realistic i mean i was every single time i would see an update i would sit back look at my computer and go jesus like i mean this stuff is wildly incredible and I said, well, if we're going to make a craft, well, we have to make the environment the craft was in. So we have the proper lighting and the exact environment it was in. So that's when we started saying, how about we start building the hangar? And these were decisions that I was taking simply because I was absolutely so happy with the quality that this tech does. And all that basically opened these floodgates. And we said, that's it. We're building S4, Area 51, Papoose Lake. We're going to build it all. The whole thing. The whole, the whole thing. thing. And um, yeah, it's really quite remarkable. And I, I have a feeling that listeners and viewers are chomping at the bit. I think they want to see some of these images. Of course. And I'm, I'm wondering if we can jump in and you can sure. yeah. uh, discuss these with us. I got your website here. We'll show that also. And I do have a link for that below. That's projectgravitor.com. Uh, uh, well, I'll show that in a minute, but how about we just jump in, Luigi, sure. to some of these images. Let me uh, start here. This Now, this is all recreated. These are all digital files. Right. But this is, so I assume you spoke with Bob about, <clears throat> like, what did it look like to walk? Yeah. You know, you're about to walk into, uh, well, describe this here. Yeah. So everything you see, although it's 
you know, for some viewers, if you say digital file, every one thing I want to make explicitly clear, everything is real size in a digital environment, in a, in an, in a 3D digital environment, meaning that if someone were to put VR goggles on, mm -hmm. this is real size. So it's not a design on a computer. It's it's a very, very heavy environment. It's very heavy on the computers. You need supercomputers to make this. So as you walk in the as you walk in this room, mm -hmm. this is that infamous security room where there was the hand bone scanner. Yeah, before we get into that, let me just uh I just want to point out because I don't think that we I made this very clear. Your team is creating really two products here. Right. So you're creating uh a film. Right. This is actually uh, about an hour and a half long or a little bit more, I think, right. featuring Bob walking through the kind of virtual recreation right. of that's for Pat Poose Lake and so forth. So that's going to be fascinating. Uh you want to release sometime in early 24. Right. Yeah. Go into right. that. But then you're describing a follow-up VR project right. by which individuals will be able to kind of do this. They'll be able to go yeah. into it. And that's what we are looking at here, essentially. Yeah, that's right. So what you're what you're <clears throat> the same environment that we're used that we built. So imagine we built yeah. everything from Groom Lake all the way to S4 Papoose Lake. Yeah. That environment is our central piece. And that is going to be used extensively in our documentary film. Yeah. And then will be available to the public on multiple different platforms, whether they want to go through it with their phones, which will be a lower resolution version, mm -hmm. all the way to a high, super high realistic quality with some uh, go 3D VR goggles. goggles. And, yeah, and they would be able to, and not only, they, they won't just be able to walk through it, they'll actually be able to interact with stuff. So if they put their hand on the scanner, it'll light up. This, uh, this is the scanner, I think. That's right. right. That's the hand bone scanner. <laughs> that Bob had to place his hand there, and there would be a bright light. It would read the the length or density of his bones, and there would be a little security ID card that would pop out of this on the right side. There's like a little uh, slot. Take mm -hmm. his card, and that at that point would swipe his card on the security panel that I, was on uh, the door I, there and enter inside of so, the S4 facility. So let's move on. So we're going yeah. into the hallway here. Uh, this is a very realistic looking hallway. I don't know how you, I, I suppose you just discussed this with Bob. He gave yeah. you this description of what it looked like and this is your recreation. So he goes to the door, hand scanner going down yeah. the hallway. And then finally we're out into the, the hangar. hangar. I think there's other rooms that, that you did not uh, show me the visuals of, but you've got other other areas here as well. Right. There's yeah. a when when you're in the hallway, the first thing you see is this very gloomy long hallway with this uh, kind of a bowling green colored cinder blocks on the bottom side, yeah. and there's doors on each side. Very quiet. Uh, he said it was very uh, very. Uh, kind of a not a very uh, inviting place if you want to call it very dead very boring he said mm -hmm. uh so there was to he one of the first things he had to do was go into this small briefing room that yeah. is not shown in these images we'll have it shown where there was all these blue documents that he was able to filter through uh there was always security there you yeah. will also everybody will also see this in the film so there was security guards at all times. Some of them were wearing desert camo security, and some of them were wearing a dark navy blue with no insignias on them. Uh, he didn't know why there was a difference. All he knew is that they were both security. Uh, there was a, a nurse station where he was asked to go there to do some allergy tests because he might be uh, because he they said you're going to be exposed to foreign materials and all and all that. So that'll be shown in the movie. Yeah, and. Then there's the infamous propulsion lab. Everybody, anybody who knows about Bob Lazar's story, he was hired by EG and G Special Projects to go work, hired by the U.S. Department of Naval Intelligence to go work at the secret facility on some kind of propulsion project. So they had told him it was going to be some advanced propulsion. So there was a laboratory in there that was absolutely dedicated to the propulsion side of whatever was going on at s4 and he that's where he worked and yeah. that'll be extent extensively shown in uh, in our documentary and then there's this hangar which is the yeah. main hangar 
where he was finally brought in. Uh, I can't remember. I think it was the second day where he was walked in S4 through the hangar door and not the main entrance door. Uh -huh. And that's when he was able to, uh, for the first time, see the uh, the disc sitting there on its belly on the ground in this hangar. Uh, there were security guards there. There was uh, not many people in the hangar as he walked in. Hey, look, here's, here's a great there shot go. of it there. There you go. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's, and this that's is beautiful. basic. Okay. Yeah. So this is the infamous Bob was, this is the, this is a sport model. This is the flying disc <laughs> that he was able to see up close. And yeah. I mean, this was something that he initially wasn't completely understanding. He didn't know what it was. And at a certain point he was able to identify that there was a, an American flag on it. Uh, it was a reversed American flag that he saw, a sticker of it. Uh, I just want to stop and, and just look at this beautiful uh, graphic rendering that you, your team did. Right. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. And you, I mean, I just love it. You see the, the flag is uh, right by the hatch, the opening there, right. uh, yeah. by the ladder. But I just think that's uh, just beautifully rendered. Uh, your team did an incredible job here. Well, this is our, our whole goal here was we wanted to, and this is what we had told Bob and Bob was saw the seriousness of our team. And that's why he agreed to work with us because he realized that we were not going to be doing anything that might have uh, reduced the quality of the story or even potentially damaged uh, more disinformation or more wrong information. There's a lot of, a lot of, uh, inaccuracies. My team spent months while we were doing this. Not only did we get information from Bob, but of course, everybody's going to Google. They're going to go and find out whatever is out there so we can get, we can pull data. And there was so much info that was wrong. So Bob mm -hmm. said, you know what, this is a great opportunity to get this down to exactly what I saw. Yeah. That way there's no more inaccuracies out there. This right. is, if anybody wants to know what I saw, this will be it. Yeah. That way, it, it's as clear as you can get it. So here's another uh, really nice angle that uh, yeah. you guys put together here. I just think that's beautiful. That's the opening hatchway, yeah, into the craft. And it's got, yeah. as you can see, it's got like this weird angled opening that has uh, a center floor kind of in the center. And then you've got this opening on the, on the bottom. That was something oh, yeah. that took quite a while to engineer properly. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, you can see the American flag there. It's another just angle that you created mm -hmm. here. Yeah, um, looks looks really good, and here as well. And that the, that flag, you know, there was there was a lot of chatter when we were doing research. There was a lot of people that had said, "Oh, you know, it's impossible that he would have seen that flag from that angle if the craft was sitting on its in in the in the hangar. He was walking <clears throat> by it." And I'll never forget when we actually had to do the first official beta testing of our virtual reality in the hangar, by the way, is mind blowing. Okay. I mean, mm -hmm. not because we did that, but it literally blew my mind because it looks, it literally looked like we were there. And the first thing I did, I remember, cause I remember reading so many comments that it was impossible to see that flag from that angle. Bob Lazar could not have seen that. So I walked, I, pur I purposely walked to the entrance of the main uh, hangar door as if I was Bob walking into that hangar, looking at the craft. And the first thing I noticed was the reversed American flag. It so was, as, it. you could see it from that angle. And I'll, I'll never forget saying, Oh my God, you could see the flag, you know? And we all st stood there. People put their goggles on and they said, you know what? Yeah, you can. And it, something that I consider to be a, uh, a win for us because that means we we measured things properly. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. a really good point. Yeah. So really because point. keep in mind, it wasn't just about what it looked like. It had to be accurate to everything. So that was important. Now, before we go inside the craft, because you have some nice recreations of that, I just want people to see uh, how some of this was done. This is an image of your this was at the, yeah, this was at the very beginning. What you're looking at here is like maybe month one as we were kind of just pulling images, trying to find anything we could uh, that uh -huh. would help us come up with at least some graphics for us to have references. 
So this uh -huh. is the very, very beginning of, of the project. And then as we moved forward, obviously, uh, we we also even had Bob himself come to yes. Montreal, yeah, spend years with us, and we worked side by side. He looked at every single aspect, every detail. Anytime something was wrong, Bob would point it out. You know, he would say, no, that was not that color or that was not there. So it was it was kind of a and and what was really cool that I considered to be real fun was he remembered tons of stuff while he was in the environment. So there was there was a moment, a aha moment for Bob. <clears throat> At a certain point, he was inside the hangar and he had this uh, tablet that we gave him and every everywhere he pointed the tablet was as if he could see where he was in the hangar. And at a certain point, we were all talking and he just said, shh, shh, shh everybody, shh. And we said, what? He goes, I saw that. And he was just near that those little stairs going into the craft. And he, uh, says, yes. and he says, I w I remember that. I remember being right there. That's so creepy. He goes, I totally remember that. And it We're talking about uh, this right here going up these stairs. Yeah, but from a from, a from a lower angle, let's say from the bottom, like you know, being on the ground because uh -huh. this image is from the top. So it was so uh -huh. cool to see him like stop and he was like i i remember that you know and he we were all like really and he goes oh fuck. he goes absolutely that happened you know so it was so genuine when he said that you know we were we were like all smiling going man this is this is a really this is a really cool project for us because not only do we get to work with the guy but we're also helping him remember because we're giving them the opportunity to revisit s4 it makes a big difference when when someone gets really good visual cues uh, to to jog their memory. I mean, it, it's you know it can happen with a good photograph that'll often bring us back. And uh, and you guys recreated something that um, I'm going to guess like even Bob or anyone close to him was never able to do to this level of exactitude. So it does kind of make sense that this would jog his memory and, and yeah, well, enable him to remember certain things that. Uh, uh may not have been there not only not only did that jog his memory but our questions were also uh something that he would we would ask him a question and he would say yeah it you know it was about you know i don't know six feet by four feet and then we would create it and he would look at it and he would go oh you know what no that that's incorrect he goes that didn't look like that he goes make it a little small so we were able to live sometimes change and you go, that's it. You know, it goes, that's how it was. And so mm -hmm. certain things were very specific. I could, we could totally see his, uh, his responses were so genuine when we get, and when he gave us, by the way, when he gave us all the dimensions of what he could remember of the craft uh, and that they had to coincide because as the uh, 3D engineers, the designers that were making this, they would always say, well, Bob only gave us these measurements of these components, but you're telling me that the, the disc should be about 52 feet. So we're going to hope, because of the way we have to build it, that this will make sense based on what he's measured uh -huh. versus the 52 feet. And also, there were things that Bob would say that were physical limitations in the craft for a human. He says it was a very, it, it, although it's a 52 feet disc, the entrance is so narrow and it's so slanted that you have to crawl into the craft. There's no way you can walk into this craft. Uh -huh. So a normal five foot 10, you know, or, or, or a, a taller person would absolutely have to crouch down on their knees and crawl in all the way to about where the amplifiers are, where you can now start. To We're going to take a look at that. Actually, maybe, maybe we should jump in there now. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so this is a distance shot as you're entering the craft, I assume. No. So no? Okay. Uh, on the left side. So if you're looking at this image, yeah, uh, you see three seats. Imagine the third seat to the left, and you would imagine the third seat to the left aiming at nine o'clock on a clock. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the entrance is at ten o'clock. So it's a it's further away. You cannot see it in this image, 
But okay. that hatchway that you saw from it being in the hangar where the little stairs are to to go in, yeah. the, the entrance is to the left at the 10 o'clock position. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But but essentially this from one edge of the right. inside of the disc, you could look forward and, and you would see these chairs. That's right. And, uh, and, and they're kind of molded into, we're going to get a closer look. Right. This is all these these components that this is one of the seats. Everything was one piece. So even the way we built it in 3D is one piece. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of a lot of work to do to blend it all in with with all its because I mean we had to make it in pieces and then put it all together. So there there's a a pretty uh it, it basically it's a one color. Everything is one material. Everything is the exact same pewter silver color. Mm -hmm. It's all blended together. These these seats were obviously molded into the ground. And and every time we would say we would call them seats, Bob would always say, Yeah, they they look like seats, but we don't we didn't know if they were actually seats. He says we are assuming they're seats, but I was he says we yeah. don't know if they were, you know. No, I mean well they sure as hell look like seats to me. Right. Sure I assume that a, a normal sized human male or human female probably could not sit in that comfortably. No, I'm actually Imagine, imagine the height of the seat would probably be to your knee or even lower. So you can imagine how tiny they were. He, he mm -hmm. clearly, he clearly indicated these were not in any way uh, designed for a human adult. Right. He says there's, like there's no way. A human child, adult, perhaps. Yeah. Maybe a small child could fit in there. Somebody, something very slim could fit, fit in there. But he was not able, he said, if I had to sit in that thing, I would have felt like I was sitting in one of those little Fisher Price seats that are made for kids that you see at Toys R Us. He says, it's just too small. So it's it's really tiny in there. Let me ask you a question. Did you or or Bob or any of your team, you had to have moments when you're putting this all together where you're thinking, good grief, this was this is alien technology. We're we're recreating alien design here. Right. Uh, do you just like, does that ever just like stop you in your tracks yeah, and it, just kind of blow, blow your mind a little bit there? Hmm? And Richard, we have countless time. Like we spent like weeks working. We would, we, some of the staff would sleep at the office. I, I'm serious. Like people would work like 12 hour shifts, sleep at the office. We have like a big, nice place. We have showers and stuff. So they would sleep there next morning there because they're, they want to get this right. And sometimes while we're sitting there looking at the screens, putting it all together, we all stop, look at each other, and we're going, dude, this is this is crazy. This is like the inside of an ET craft. And and yeah. we got so familiar with it that at a certain point it, it didn't impress us anymore because we just knew exactly what it was at all sure. times. And when we started pulling out some images and renders and people saw it. We were worried. We're like, ah, fuck, we hope people like this. You know, it's, we hope this is what. And the first person was Bob. The first person we had to show was Bob. You know, the, I remember there was a call that we did with him on Zoom. And we said, we're going to share our screen. And we want you to tell us what you think. And we shared the screen and we went into the craft. And I'll never forget it. I actually have it recorded. I don't think I'll ever put it public. But we have that call recorded. And Bob literally just went, oh, my God. He says, you got it. He says, you did it. And he and he used the word creepy a lot. He says, look at those seats. Look how creepy they are. I remember that, that creepiness about them. So they have like this weird shape to them. And they're, they're, they're small. And, and he said it was so, it was such a very bare bones environment. It was so one yeah. color. There was nothing in there. It was almost uninviting. It was, it was, he always said ominous. He says ominous a lot, but with us, he said creepy a lot. And he said, I always felt like I didn't belong in there when I was in there. And, uh, the components, he says, you, you, you got the amplifiers correctly. He, the seats are correct. The, the position. We'll look at those in a second, by the way. The yeah. Amplifiers. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, and we showed him that famous honeycomb hatchway that he's talked about many times. Mm -hmm. I don't have a picture for you here, but 
there's this little hatchway that's on the ground behind the seats that uh, was, he was able to explain that was explainable to him. It was like you basically you pull on it and you could open this hatch. They had all collapsed on itself. It, it looked like honey, a, a honeycomb, like the cereal mm -hmm. placed, you know, uh, uh, horizontally embedded into the ground. You just put your finger in one of the holes and you pull and it just collapse on itself. And then you can access the lower level. He saw that. He saw how we created that. And he was like, Jesus, he goes, you, you did it, you know, and, yeah. and we thought that's cool. I'm, I'm happy that we did. And I said, you know, based on all the data that we got, I really would have been surprised if we would have missed it. Because in reality, the thing is really simple. The craft is very simple. Mm -hmm. there, there's no buttons in there. There's no levers in there. There's 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 nothing in there. It's remarkable. Let me let me ask you about this now. So there now we're getting into some of the people can see the chair. One of the chairs is in the background there. Mm -hmm. And explain what we're looking at in the foreground okay. here. Yeah. <clears throat> well, this is a this is an one of the first renders that we have pulled out. So what we have here, what you're looking at, the seat that's in the background is the center seat which mm -hmm. is the seat that is right in front of the placement of where the reactor goes. So you're looking, we're looking at this square base plate with a small tower in the center of it with a next kind of a next uh, design on the base plate. And you have a hemisphere that has been removed in this particular case because it usually is applied on top. So it covers mm -hmm. that tower. Sure. Now that reactor uh, has a small indentation, the ground of the actual ground of the craft, where it sits, there's a small square indentation right there where the reactor sits. Uh -huh. Okay. So that's where they know where to place it. It doesn't, it doesn't lock in. It doesn't magnetically connect in. It, it just sits in that square. And uh, as soon as the Hemisphere is then, well, obviously the element 115 is inside that tower, by the way. That's where the 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 fuel, if you want to call it, of this reactor is. Mm -hmm. It is inserted inside that little tower. There's a cap that goes on it. You take the hemisphere, apply it on top of the reactor. And at that point, you have your uh, completed reactor. Now, before you can get anything really started there's a pipe that's hanging from the ceiling you can actually see it in the other image that you had prior to this one uh, let me go back, go back. Um, uh, yeah here? So yes. as, as you can see there's this vertical pipe that is hanging from the ceiling that is directly above the hemisphere when the when the reactor is in its set place that pipe has like a, a basically a, a edge that is rounded off so that it can perfectly apply on top of the hemisphere. And that was something that Bob was very uh, detailed about where he said it was about three inches in diameter mm -hmm. and you could pull it down or pull it up from the ceiling. Mm. And it did not have a telescopic mechanism. It's the material itself would just simply disappear into the craft so really it, yeah wow. he says you could not we could not see how this thing was being pushed in to the ceiling and when we pulled it out we couldn't tell he said how it was coming out it was like just magic he goes oh, in yeah. so he says it was very bizarre to see something like that because you were usually used to something that like a telescopic thing that one goes into yeah. the other and so he says that was something that really blew my mind. He said, because I couldn't figure out where that was. Is this going. something that, that no one at S4 understood? Did Bob know whether this was understood by anybody the else? The only person Bob was able to communicate with was his lab partner, Barry Castillo. Yes. And okay. uh, Barry Castillo had been very informative to Bob throughout the time that he was there. So Bob would ask questions. Barry would say, yeah, this, you know, this pipe does this, but there were no answers. So it it's basically, yes, we know it does this. We've already observed this. This has been noted, 
but we can't figure out how it's doing it. And no, nobody's ever found Barry Castillo, by the way. Nobody has. No, no they, they've never. Um, yeah. Interesting. In fact, yeah. It's, it, it's Bob was asked a few times, you know, have you ever been in contact with him? Or he says, no, I, I never. He goes, that, that was it. I, I, when Bob was on Joe Rogan, he actually said, he goes, he would have wished that Barry would have come out after he went out or at least something like that. But that never happened. And he says, maybe all this caused an even higher degree of security that changed the entire project completely. He doesn't know that. So that was a hard, uh, that was hard. Whether, you don't even know if he's alive at this point. It's been so many years. Right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you, let's just look at some of these other images. This is the same. This is the uh, same. Yeah. This is basically, you're looking at the reactor from another angle. It's, angle. The cap has been removed. This is a reactor inside the lab. Yeah. So now, uh, ex now we, you and I discussed this just before we went on and you explained that this is a, literally a separate reactor. Right. Yeah, there's two, there were two. Yeah, this is a this is actually a really important part of the story, yeah. which will be highly detailed in the in the movie. So, there was a propulsion lab that was right adjacent to the main hangar where Bob was able to uh, view and inspect the sport model disc. Mm -hmm. That propulsion lab uh, was already set up when he was when he arrived at S4 the very first time. So when he walked into the lab with and was introduced to Barry Castillo by Dennis Mariani, who was his superior at the time, mm -hmm. uh, there were a whole bunch of things in the uh, lab already. So uh, he later found out that this was a propulsion reactor, some gravity reactor that was sitting on the table, as you see it here. You yeah. have the hemisphere of the base and all that. And then there was the element 115, which is this triangular piece that's copper colored, uh, just and sitting the on the table. Yeah. And then on the ground to the left of the reactor mm -hmm. was one of those amplifiers, those, those rectangular consoles that are near the seats. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's, in, it's actually, very important to note that although the craft has been depicted in the past by many people and there's a lot of designs of it and a lot of people did some people did great work while others uh so so uh one amplifier was actually missing in the craft when he went in there meaning when they had cut it with a plasma cutter they cut out an amplifier so that was something that I remember have, we had very big, we, we've talked about this extensively also for the film, because he said they must have been really sure that they had to be 100% sure that that would not cripple the craft if they did that. Uh -huh. Because he says they decided to cut into whatever that was. And he said, we didn't even know what that thing was real, how it did what it did. So that was a big deal for him that they had already established the fact that they understood that that was potentially safe to cut that piece out. So I don't have an image of the amplifier here. I don't think. Well, you all, you have it uh, simply with that image of the in entirety of the interior of the craft with the seats where you see a rectangular. I'm going to um, that there. And and what I could do oh, I, that uh, large rectangle yeah, behind. These, see these? There's two of them here. Okay, this is, this is behind uh, the seat. The seat is facing toward the viewer here. Right. So there's behind the seat. Yeah, you have yeah, one right. that's centered right behind the seat, and then you have another one that's on the right of the right seat. Uh huh. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And then there's one on the left that you, is not there. It's missing because that's actually what Bob experience there was it was not there it was not there oh yeah. okay i see and How so in the lab there was this amplifier sitting on the ground to the left of the reactor and on a adjacent table there was an emitter a a cylindrical uh which was what is on the lower half of the craft i don't think i sent you an image Richard, yeah, we, like, right, we I, just have this here. I this could potentially, here. you know, I could potentially share my screen and show you what an emitter looked like. Uh, but the cylindrical em emitter was on its side, 
It's about a four foot by two foot cylinder. It was black outside and it was kind of a copper colored inside. Mm -hmm. And it was just sitting there on this table to the left. And Barry had explained to him that when these three components, the reactor, the amplifier, and the emitter are in proximity, it just works. Now, how it works, we, we don't know. We just know that it works. So okay. that was the core objective of him being at S4 was to figure out how all this stuff worked. And he said it was just assumptions after assumptions, writing notes, you know, figuring, trying to look through things and trying to test things to understand what yeah. is what is it doing. And to this day, Bob says, I, I don't think they know how it works even today. Interesting. Very interesting. I think yeah. I have one more image from the interior of the craft. Yeah. Uh, I, had, I lightened this slightly, but this is looking are, uh, at the interior of the edge, clearly, of, of the disc, right? Yeah. And and this, <clears> is a, this is what, if you could see, that's like a, there's archways, kind of. You could see those archways. Yes, yes, yes. And the, the, yeah, those archways right. is what Bob calls the superstructure of the craft. Mm -hmm like a one layer and then there's like an outer shell layer layer around it. Uh, if you remember at uh, when, when Bob explained his story, one of the, those archways became transparent at one point mm -hmm. while it was inside the craft. There was a team working by the archway and while he and, and Barry were analyzing the position of the reactor in the center of the craft, there was a moment where the arch, well, well this, this archway just became completely clear, like you could see right outside the craft, as if there was nothing there. And that caught his attention, and mm -hmm. he, he stood up, and there was about one-third of the screen, one-third of the archway, had become a, kind of a screen, if you want to call it. It was a, it was a bluish, see-through part of the archway mm -hmm. with these black symbols that appeared. They looked, he, he kept, he kept repeating referring them to us like little eyes because of the way they were they look like like oval shapes with these circles in them so he goes they look like eyes at first and there was a lot of symbols and they were they were moving like this on the screen like they were kind of doing this they weren't static they were moving yeah. and he actually he we, we chuckled about this because he he got up and it caught his attention and he started walking towards he just took a step and he remembers he says you know barry re went bob bob come back because you're not allowed to do that like you're you're you can't do that but he says i remember standing up and wanting to go and figure out how the hell that happened yeah and i immediately it, whatever yeah yeah and i immediately had barry go no 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 bob bob like you know you're gonna get in deep shit here so he he goes Sh you know I, I went back to the reactor and it kind of, you know, he says, I, I didn't get to go close to it, but I saw it and it was as clear as, as if there was nothing there. So that's something that, and that's why we show that image because those that's what those archways look like from the interior. Yeah, no, it's just, it's just fascinating. Uh, that actually is all of the kind of interior shots and exterior shots that uh, I have here. Uh, I'll just show a couple of other nice images that you um sent me just to give people an idea of uh, how this project turned out. So you have a camera person and behind yeah. her is an interesting image on the screen there. Maybe you can describe that. Yeah, this was a cool moment in the way we were filming with Bob in Montreal in our mm -hmm. studio. So to the right, you can't, you can't, you'll see another picture later, but to the right, Bob is on this ginormous green screen. I'm going to show it right here. There's Bob. There, yeah, there's Bob. There's the green screen. We have all yeah. our markers there. Yeah. So this this was done to create the most highly realistic uh, introduction of the real Bob inside the highly realistic unreal environment. Yeah. So what yeah. was happening is while he was being videotaped, that we told him you're now in the in the hangar mm -hmm. live. He was seeing live on the TV exactly what he was where he was. I so see. that was that was really cool for him because it allowed him to move 
very uh, freely knowing that he wasn't going to be banging into something because even though he didn't have anything to bang himself on on the green screen we didn't want those things to happen when we actually brought that those movements of him the, the right. mocap of him into the the scene so there's some really really cool and really high-tech uh precision work that we did to provide the visuals that everybody's going to see in this yeah. film it's fascinating there there's yeah. bob looking good there and you have a couple of other images of bob here i'll just show yeah that's um, him that's him in oregon in his in his lab yeah and in fact uh the uh the thing in front of him that uh yeah is a death ray <laughs> it says death ray yeah on it which is kind of we had a lot of fun with that. That that thing yeah. is so <laughs> that's a that thing is so badass. Like it's it's crazy. I mean, that is a super cool. I mean, I don't I've never seen that before. And Bob activated it for us a couple of times and it will burn a hole through anything so like it's oh, crazy, God. crazy God. powerful. And you know, this is stuff Bob makes, you that's know, this is works on it. This, he does pretty cool stuff, actually. He's the guy who everyone knew as the guy who liked to blow things up. He was great at that. Uh, just a couple of nice pictures of Bob here. I think this might be the last one. This is the last one here. Yeah, that's that's him with his with his uh, infamous uh, jet bike that we yeah. took for a spin a couple of times. Really cool. Uh, yeah, we had good uh, times. We had really good times. He's a he's such a cool guy. He's such a down to earth, yeah. normal, humble, good person. Mm -hmm. I mean, my whole team, everybody fell in love with Bob and his and his wife and his entourage. At first, I had people on my team that were like, eh, you know, there's a lot of things out there on Bob Lazar we're not too sure of. And once they met him and spent a lot of time with Bob, the entire team all like unanimously all said, yeah, this guy's not bullshitting. Yeah. This guy's for real. Yeah. There was not one red flag was ever raised in our entire two years working with the guy. I've always felt this way about Bob Lazar myself, um, researching his uh, story. And uh, Bob and I met briefly on one occasion. I don't know him nearly as well as you do, but I, I found him to be very genuine. And uh, more to the point, I just always found him to be uh, a thousand percent consistent with every single thing he ever said. Uh, even under periods of great pressure and duress against him personally, uh, he, he always stayed the course. And I think he's uh, he's fortunate that he's gotten to live long enough to see his yeah. reputation be very, very strongly corroborated by many, many developments in the field. He that's is right. the, uh, you know, he's the, you could say the original whistleblower, right? Well, that's that's going to be the, the name of our movie. Yeah. Our movie is going to be called <laughs> Lazar, the original whistleblower. It's kind of, it's kind of helping you walk right into that one. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, by the way, I just want people to see your website here. This is uh, Gravator, uh, projectgravator.com. I will have a link below and people can just kind of uh, see what you got going on here. Yeah. There's a lot of information about it. And and there's, so on. There you have the, yeah, we have like, there's some information on Bob. If you click, you, you could check it out. I mean, there's going to, there's going to be a lot going on on our social media real soon, by the way, mm -hmm. everybody's got to look out for our, we are not alone YouTube page. Is this the first interview that you're doing on this? This is the first. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This so I, I thought so. so. And I actually <laughs> wanted, I wanted it. I, 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 respect you so much that I wanted it to be the first. Oh, thank yeah. you very much. And I, I honestly, I think uh, the, the viewers of this are going to thank you the most. Uh, this is a really interesting project that you and your team have done. Uh, it's obviously very sophisticated, Luigi. And, um, and I think it's, it's interesting that you've got really two aspects of this thing going on. So there'll be a film treatment where we right. will hear Bob uh, talk about his experience with all of the uh, as accurate as possible recreations around him. I think that by itself is fascinating. I think I make I can imagine many people are going to want to see that. But then it's quite possible. I mean, we'll have to find out if even more popular will be your follow-on, which will be the virtue of the VR experience that people themselves can can engage in to kind of go through as for and not just the hangar, uh, from what I'm understanding from really? you, but the entire. The whole base. The whole base. I mean, if anybody listening knows the story, just to give you a little idea how cool this is, 
you could go for a stroll on Papoose Lake. You could walk through the main entrance, put your hand on the hand scanner, get your ID card, swipe it, get into the hallway. You can go to the nurse station. You can walk into the briefing room, sit down and read the briefing documents. You'll be able to go into the propulsion lab and actually physically manipulate the pieces. If you know what they do, you can actually take element 115, put in the tower, put the cap on, put the yeah. atmosphere, twist the, the emitter and gravity happens. You'll be able to go into the hangar. You'll see all not the other eight hangars. At one time, Bob saw all these hangar doors open. You will see that all the other crafts are there. The jello mold, the top hat and other design. Unbelievable. Design. So it's pretty cool. When, when I, I started researching the whole UFO topic, uh, my first full year of really being immersed, I think it was 1993, about 30 years ago. And um, so Bob Lazar was, he was known, his story was still kind of fresh, you know, he yeah. was only up a couple of years. And when I would go on to what was then the internet, there was an internet in 1993, yeah, basically all the bulletin boards <laughs> and all of that. Um, there was a lot of talk about Lazar. And, you know, it's just kind of an amazing thing for me personally to, to think back because I remember that time quite well. And, and now here we are 30 years later and you have recreated in, I think, extreme virtual reality detail that entire experience that Bob had, or at least as much as realistically we can expect at this point. Right. Uh, that's a remarkable thing for uh, me to think about. And I've, I have to think anyone who remembered when the Bob Lazar story broke, and I know there's uh, listeners and viewers out there who do remember it, uh, they too must be blown away by what you and your team have been able to accomplish now. You know, it took three decades, uh, a little little more than three decades, right. but we've gotten to a point where you've got the the graphic capability, the scientific uh, uh, applications in place, and all of that that you can create not just the sports model craft. Right. That's interesting enough. Right. Not just the hangar that it was encased in. That's cool. That's interesting. Not just the building, the hallway, the briefing room, all of that. All of it. But the base itself. Ah, I mean, I, I'm just going to say on behalf of everyone, thank you for doing this. Well, this is a, this is a genuine service to the community. And I just, I, I find it rather exciting and I'm very glad. Let me just say this last thing that we can talk about it here on this program. Well, I'm very, very glad to be able to do that. I'm, I'm really glad and thank you for that. But what I want and what my team wants is we can't wait to show it to everyone because we want to see what people say. Because we're yeah. also, we're being very humble here and we're going, okay, we did a good job, but we, you know, you never know what people will say, but I'm, I'm pretty optimistic as well that we've done something that's going to be really cool. I uh, I suspect so. So um, I guess we're going to wrap this up here. We've we've gone a really good length of time. Uh, do you have an idea as to when you think the film? I think it's the film is coming out first, and then the VR experience after that. When? Right. What's your timeline that you're looking at right now? So we're 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 looking at uh, first quarter of 2024. We had initially had thought that it was going to be in December of this year, but unfortunately, there's certain things that are just not possible at that time. Uh, we're negotiating. We're already in talks with some people, which mm -hmm. is cool. We don't know where that's going to go. Uh, we do feel that it will be first quarter. I'm hoping it's February. My personal hope, my aim is February. Okay. My whole team's aim is February, but it, there's so many pieces. This is yeah. a lot of, this is a big, uh, there's a lot of pieces moving at the same time. And following that is going to be, I mean, if the movie comes out in February, and we hope we hope so. Mm -hmm. We're going to give it maybe two or three months after the movie that we will finalize the VR experience to be sure. launched, probably on Steam or something where it'll be available on so many different platforms at that mm -hmm. point. But so that people can experience it after they see it. So the best thing is watch the movie. You'll see everything. You'll hear Bob saying everything. And then after that, you could go be Bob in S4. <laughs> So, yeah, I want to. Yeah, <laughs> I want to go in. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, 
Well, good. I'm I'm so glad we did this, Luigi. This has been an absolute delight. And um, I'm glad that you got the full cooperation of Bob on the Thank project. You, and, Thank uh, you, Richard. Yeah. Yeah, it just seems like it's done uh, at a very high level, uh, very accurate. It's the kind of thing where you and your, your guys, your team, have really uh, filled in uh, a, a kind of a, a big missing piece that I think a lot of people have wanted all this time. And um, certainly I, I did not expect any pro kind of project like this. And it's a, it's a great surprise. So awesome. uh, yeah, we can't, we, we, we can't wait to show them. We can't wait. Yeah. Well, uh, that makes many of us. So uh, we will, we will definitely stay tuned for that. Again, I will uh, just remind uh, listeners, I have the link to project Gravator uh, below. I would encourage people to go check it out. And um, until then, I guess when when this does come out, maybe we can uh, we can get together and we can discuss that. Again. Yeah, I mean, even follow us on Instagram. It's always Project Gravitor. Follow us on YouTube. It's under We Are Not Alone on YouTube. Right. By the way, it's not Project Gravitor. And we'll have uh, the links. We'll, the link. You'll have all the others. Some great stuff coming this month. By the Fabulous. way, so, Fabulous. yeah. Well, uh, I want to thank you, Luigi Venditelli. What a fantastic discussion we had here. Thank you for all the information. Uh, I want to thank the listeners for hanging out with us during this period of time. If you uh, like what we've done here, you know what to do. Please like and share the video. Subscribe to my channel. That always helps me out. If you really like what I do on a regular basis, go to my website, richardolanmembers.com, where I do this type of work all the time, many days a week. We've got a great community there as well. I also want to thank my YouTube membership community here uh, for supporting the work that uh, I do as well. So I want to thank everyone um, for that. And that's it. Thank you again, Luigi. Thank All you, right. listeners. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. We'll be back again. This is uh, the end, and I'll catch you all again really soon. Let's keep fighting the good fight later. <laughs>